This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. <coughs> Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan <coughs> does like knowing animals. <coughs> Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan <coughs> does like knowing animals. <coughs> Hello everyone and welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast in which we speak to animal studies scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Josh Milburn and I'm standing in for Siobhan O'Sullivan. Siobhan and I both like knowing animals. This episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association, which you can join now. It costs 60 Australian dollars if you're a waged academic and only 15 Australian dollars if you are unwaged, a student or precariously waged. You can follow ASA on Facebook, where you can find them at ASA Australasian Animal Studies Association, or on Twitter at AASA underscore animals. This episode is also brought to you by the Animal Public's book series from Sydney University Press. The 1st of February saw the release of the latest book in the series, which is Enter the Animal, Cross-Species Perspectives on Grief and Spirituality by Taya Brooks Preback. This is the 11th book in the series and the second of 2021. You can find out more about Enter the Animal and all the other books in the series if you go to the website. Just search for Animal Publix Book Series on your favourite search engine. This week on Knowing Animals, we're joined by a returning guest, and that's Professor Robert Garner. Until his retirement last year, Rob was a professor in the Department of Politics at the University of Leicester. He is now an emeritus professor and is reading for an MA in Creative Writing at the University of East Anglia. Over his career, he has authored or co-authored seven books about animals in ethics and politics and edited or co-edited three more. Now, these include Animals, Politics and Morality, which was published in 1993 with a second edition in 2004. The Animal Rights Debate, Abolition or Regulation, which is a 2010 debate book co-authored with Gary Francione, and A Theory of Justice for Animals, which was published in 2013. Today we're going to be talking about Rob's latest book, which is The Oxford Group and the Emergence of Animal Rights and Intellectual History. This was co-authored with Yuan de Ocalai and published by Oxford University Press in 2021. Welcome to the podcast, Rob. Thanks, Josh. Glad to be here. Now, can you start by telling us a little bit about what inspired you to write about this subject? Yeah, can I, can I start, Josh, if I may, by wishing Siobhan a speedy recovery? I know she's had a very tough time over the past few months and uh, my thoughts are with her. So get well soon, Siobhan. Right. Well, I had been aware for years that, that there was, there'd was been this group of people who converged on Oxford in the, in the late 1960s and formed a very informal friendship group, which thought and wrote about and promoted vegetarianism and animal rights. And that from these interactions, came a couple of really seminal publications, um, the edited book Animals, Men and Morals, and Singer's Animal Liberation. And I don't have to tell listeners of this podcast how important animal liberation has been. And yet relatively little is known about its origins. Why did Singer come to write it? and Why was it written in the way that it was? Singer arrived in, at Oxford from Australia in 1969 to take a postgraduate course in ethics and political philosophy. And what's really fascinating is that uh, when Peter and his wife Renata arrived in Oxford, they weren't really concerned about the treatment of animals at all. He hadn't really thought much about vegetarianism or animal rights. He didn't know any vegetarians personally at the time. And neither he nor Renata can re- remember having met a vegetarian before encountering the other members of the Oslo group. I mean, it's more than that, too. The, the singers were committed and, and not apologetic meat eaters before arriving in Oxford. Uh, they came from a culture where they ate a lot of meat. And all of this was to change during Singer's time in Oxford, where he met the others in this so-called Oxford group. Now, the Oxford group is familiar to those, to, to many who, who, who have read about the emergence of the animal rights movement, but it's usually passed over very quickly. I wanted to know more about it to, to find out who the members were, where they came from, how they met, what they did, and what the impact of the, of, of the group membership was on the individuals. 
I also thought that this research was really timely given that the Oxford group members aren't getting any younger. So I recognised that I would need some funding to ca carry out this research, not least because I would need to involve someone with an expertise in oral history interviewing. So I applied to the Leverhulme Trust, which is a UK charitable body, I was lucky enough to be successful in getting two years funded, uh, funding. I then recruited Yuandi, who, who has a background in oral history, and she conducted all of the interviews for the project. So should we start at the start? Who were the Oxford group? Uh, who was in the group and what does it mean to refer to them as a group? Well, the Oxford group included, as it's called, members, 10 individuals. The, the label, the Oxford group, actually came from Richard Ryder's uh, later writing on it. But we identified 10 core members. Nine of these are, are still alive. One of them, uh, Mike Peters, who was a, who became a sociologist teaching at uh, Leeds Polytechnic, has since died, but the others are still alive, and we interviewed most of them. I think the Oxford group consisted of a number of intersecting networks rather than one. Um, there's no evidence to suggest that all of the all of the ten ever met as a whole in one place, although they may have done. But they certainly all knew each other. So the ten were th uh, consisted of three married couples: Peter and Renata Singer, of course, together with Rosalind and Stanley Godlevich, and Richard and Mary Keshen. And then there were three singletons who shared a house in Oxford, and that's John Harris, David Wood, and Michael Peters. And the final member was Richard Ryder, and he was slightly more at the periphery, partly because of his age and partly because he, he wasn't an Oxford student or wasn't married to one as the, the others were. So Singer, Wood, Peters, Harris, Keshin and Stan Godlovich were graduate students doing philosophy, and Ryder was working as a clinical psychologist in Oxford. Mary Keshen and Renata Singer came to Oxford with her husband and works outside of academia. Uh, Mary worked for Pergamon Press in Oxford and uh, Renata worked as a, as, a, as a school teacher. The Oxford group was really a, a very informal friendship group and that can be contrasted with, with conventional groups in academia centering on university uh, departments. And the reason they met was, was purely by accident, really. I mean, there was this... This meeting between Peter Singer and Richard Keshen after a lecture in 1970 that they both attended. And afterwards, Peter and uh, Richard uh, went to Richard's college at Balliol for lunch. And whilst they were waiting to be served, Richard asked whether the spaghetti contained meat. Richard opted for the salad instead. And when they sat down, P Peter was curious as to why Richard had, had turned down the meat option. And then Richard regaled Peter with the case for vegetarianism and, and veganism and invited him to meet his friends, in particular Ros and Stan, who lived in North Oxford, in a flat in North Oxford. And it all really stemmed from there. They gradually, all ten, gradually got to know each other in, in a very informal sense. I mean, you know, they weren't just meeting together because they were interested in animal issues. It, it was that they were also friends and uh, socialised together and went on holiday together. In the book, you describe the Oxford group as a collaborative circle. Could you explain what that means? Yes. Um, collaborative circle is, is a concept which derives from the work of the American sociology, Michael Farrell. And by a collaborative circle, he means an informal and non-hierarchical friendship group. And this can be contrasted, as I said earlier, with, with a traditional kind of academic group, which is, tends to be very hierarchical because it's based on the, the hierarchy which exists in academia, professors and their students and junior researchers and so forth. So the, these non-hierarchical friendship groups exist at the fringes of academia. I guess that one of the best examples of a collaborative circle is, is the so-called Bloomsbury Group, which was a collection of highly creative, disciplined, productive artists and thinkers who were a powerful force in the artistic and, and intellectual life of post-Victorian England. And the assumption behind the idea of a collaborative circle is that membership is an explanatory variable. 
That is that membership of the group has a creative function, enabling the production of something or things that wouldn't have occurred had the group not existed. The, the whole, in other words, is more than the sum of its parts. And what Michael Farrell does is to seek to understand the common dynamics of these collaborative circles and their structural characteristics developed over time. And, and Farrell develops a typology of uh, collaborative circles. He argues that all collaborative circles go through a number of stages, um, namely formation, rebellion, creation, collective action and separation. And so it seemed to me quite obviously that, that the Oxford group is a, looked in, superficially at least, as a, a useful test case of collaborative circles. So we asked to what extent the Oxford group exhibited the characteristics of a collaborative circle and the degree to which it had a creative influence on its members, and in particular, the influence on Singer. What did Singer gain from being a member of this collaborative circle? Well, I definitely want to ask a little bit more about that final point about the influence on Singer and the the role of the collaborative circle in his intellectual development. Uh, But first of all, I want to ask a quick question about methodology. So you mentioned before that this was interview based, but you mentioned that it was it was Yuande doing the interviews. Um, And the thing that struck me reading this is that your work that I've read in the past would be quite straightforwardly categorised as political theory, whereas I think this is more a book of intellectual history, I think is the phrase you use. So could you tell us a little bit more about the approach and who it was you interviewed and and the context of that? Yeah, well, the the project was a steep learning curve for me in the sense, as you rightly say, most of my previous work can be categorised as as political theory. That's why it was important that we developed... uh, theoretical framework, which uh, I utilised the idea of collaborative circles with, that avoided the project becoming a, a descriptive narrative, this happened then and that happened then and so forth. So we had a very clear theoretical framework. In terms of oral history methodology, it was very important that I recruited someone who knew something about it, and that was where Yuandi comes in. That question is probably best directed at Yuandi and and not me. But clearly what we did was to, after identifying the the people we thought were central to the Oxford group, we located them, asked for their consent, and then Yuandi conducted the interview, recorded them and transcribed them and so forth. Did you manage to speak to everyone uh, who's still alive who was in the Oxford group? No, as is as is their their right. Two people in particular wanted no involvement with the project. That was Stan and Roz Godlovich. Uh, we tried endlessly to get them to participate, but they they were unwilling to do so. But I think interviewing the others enabled us to get a fair sense of the Godloviches' involvement. But it clearly would have been helpful to have had Roz and Stan interviewed as well. Yes, that's a shame that you weren't able to talk to Ros and Stan, um, especially as my next question is going to be about Ros Godlovich to a certain extent. So coming back to this idea of the, the collaborative circle, I suspect almost all of our listeners will have read or at least come across work by Peter Singer. So I want to get to the bottom of the influence that the Oxford group had on him. So in chapter four of the book, you identify key collaborative pairings, so smaller collaborative groups within the collaborative circle. And the collaborative pairings that you're identifying are Peter Singer and Richard Ryder and Peter Singer and Ros Godlovich. Now, I think the influence of Richard Ryder on Singer is comparatively well known. So Ryder, of course, came up with this idea of speciesism, which Singer then used in Animal Liberation in his subsequent work. But I think the relationship between Godlovich and Singer is a bit more complicated I'm sure you've heard the same, but in unguarded moments, I've heard people say that Singer took or even stole some of his best ideas from Godlovich. So I suppose I have a two-part question for you. First, could you explain a little bit more about this idea of a collaborative pairing? And second, could you tell us a bit about the specific collaborative pairing of Ros Godlovich and Peter Singer? Yes, well, uh, Farrell, Michael Farrell talks about the importance of 
uh, collaborative pairings within the creative stage. In other words, it's not all necessarily all members of a collaborative circle who who are equally important in determining the, the creative endeavour of the group. In the case of the Oxford group, a number of the the, the members after they became vegetarians and vegans in some cases, that was really as far as as far as they went. And this is partly because people like John Harris and David Wood weren't particularly interested in moral philosophy anyway. But also because in the case of Mary Keshin and, and uh, Renata Singer, they weren't philosophers at all and weren't involved in, in the academic community. So the really key relationship was between after we talked about Ryder and Singer, as you mentioned, was between Peter Singer and Ross Godlevich. And, and their relationship is very difficult to determine, partly because Ross didn't want to be interviewed with the projects I said. But we raise the issue of, of this claim that, you know, Singer's ideas was, was stolen in some way from, from Ross. We raised it with him, in, in a polite way, of course. And he's open that he was influenced greatly by Ross, not just in terms of his particular approach to animal ethics, but also, you know, his initial sortie into, into, into the field without meeting Richard Keshin and then Ros and Stan. Peter Singer may not have pursued his work in, in animal ethics. He may have decided to focus on something else. Now, Ros and Peter clearly had many discussions and debate about animal rights often on their own, without the others being involved, sometimes at dinner parties where the others were there. And I'll make a number of points here, I think. Firstly, the claim that Ros is important, more important than has previously been suggested, is that she wrote two published pieces on animal rights philosophy before Singer wrote anything. There was a journal article in 1771, I think it was published, and then her chapter in Animals, Men and Morals, which was the edited book that uh, members of the Oxford group put together. Now, Singer was too late on the scene to have a chapter in that book. So it was his influence on uh, Ros or vice versa in terms of a book chapter that's really of importance to us. Now, superficially, Ros's approach to animal ethics was very different. In particular, she adopts a rights-based approach and... Peter Singer is, of course, a utilitarian. Well, what's interesting about this is that her book chapter contains some material that is not in the journal article. And interestingly, this new material focuses on the importance of interests and, in particular, the concept of the equal consideration of interests. And anyone who knows Singer's work will know that that's a, a key concept for, for Singer, which uh, appears in Animal Liberation. So we ask in the book why this new material a, a, appeared. Did Peter Singer get this idea from Ros Godlevich? In other words, it, is her influence on animal ethics much more important than has been previously acknowledged? Now, bearing in mind here the absence of Ros's own account, we came to the conclusion that, that Singer arrived at the consideration principle independently of Ros and that the inclusion of it in Ros's book chapter is probably a result of his influence on her. And we come to this conclusion in a variety of ways. One argument is that Singer was already a utilitarian before he arrived in Oxford, and of course focusing on interest is a, is a utilitarian preoccupation. Singer had also been influenced by political philosophers such as Stanley Benn, who had written extensively about equality and Ben had actually talked about the equal consideration of interests in terms of human beings, not involving animals. So the evidence suggests that that principle, uh, the equal consideration of interest principle, was Singer's, and it appeared in Ross's book chapter because they talked to each other about it. But none of this is, to, is meant to suggest that, that Ross didn't influence Peter at all. As I said, it, you know, it was from Ros Godlevich that Singer got his initial interest in animals as an object of ethical concern. And uh, you know, for that alone, Ros's contribution deserves to be recovered and promoted. I'll read out a quote, actually, from, um, from Singer, a quote that, that Singer gave us, and, and it goes like this. My recollection is that during the many long conversations I had with Ros, 
we were learning from each other. Although I hasten to add that I learned more from her than she did from me, because putting aside my first conversation with Richard Keshin, Roz was introducing me to entirely new, for me, an entirely new way of thinking about animals. Whereas I was suggesting to Roz a different, more utilitarian framework in which she could defend her views about animals. Thank you. That's that's very, very interesting. And I want to pick up on just one of the things you said there about Singer being a utilitarian before he arrived in Oxford, because there's another key potential influence on Singer that we, we have to mention, and that's R.M. Hare, who was his postgraduate supervisor and, of course, a very well-known utilitarian philosopher. So to what extent do you think R.M. Hare might have had an important influence on Singer's thinking on animals? That's a complex question. I mean, clearly Hare was important because he was Singer's supervisor for his postgraduate thesis whilst he was in Oxford. And clearly, of all the academics, of all the applied ethicists at Oxford at the time, Hare was the most important. But Singer had already been, in Australia, Singer had already been attracted by the idea of utilitarianism. So it wasn't that Hare made Singer a utilitarian. In addition to that, I don't think Pear was was, um, particularly influential in Singer's uh, inclusion of animals within the the moral community. In fact, in some ways, it's the other way around, that that Hare's view, Hare's limited amount of writing on on animal ethics, was actually partly influenced by Singer himself. In fact, the others others in the Oxford group had a pretty poor opinion of, of Hare, not least because... I think Hare ceased to be a vegetarian or was only a vegetarian because his wife insisted upon it or something, something of that sort. And that uh, he continued to eat meat in, 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 in a limited sense. So John Harris told us that, that they regarded Hare as a Professor Hypocrite, they called him. Hare's influence on Singer's particular brand of utilitarianism may have been important, but I think he had less of an influence on Singer's adoption of animals. I think the Oxford group is really a crucial explanatory variable for that. Well, that's a fascinating piece of old academic gossip there. I wanted to ask, before we move on to our closing questions, about the output of the Oxford group, because I think that might be quite interesting for for listeners who want to learn a little bit more about what the Oxford group did. In chapter five of the book, you list five published works that came out from the Oxford group. We've mentioned several of them already. One was the 1971 article by Ros Godlovich in the journal Philosophy. Uh, One was the 1971 edited collection, Animals, Men and Morals, which was edited by the Godloviches and John Harris. One was Singer's 1973 review of Animals, Men and Morals. Then there's Singer's 1975 Animal Liberation, which of course has been very widely read. And then finally, there's Richard Ryder's 1975 book, Victims of Science. I'm guessing that a lot of listeners will have read Animal Liberation. And indeed, it's a book that's actually often mentioned on this podcast as a, as a kind of early influence on, on our guests. But I'm guessing that lots of listeners won't have read or perhaps even heard of some of these other works. So do you think it's important for us to still be reading these early works of animal ethics today? Without doubt. In fact, some of the themes in animal, Animals, Men and Morals, particularly in terms of their very absolute conviction that there's no reformist route towards animal rights and an animal rights agenda. It has very important uh, things to say about the the, the modern debate. And uh, Victims of Science, it still remains the best single authored account of of animal experimentation, in, in my view. The interesting thing about Animals, Men and Morals too is that it contains chapters by some who were associated but not central members of the Oxford group, in particular Bridget Brophy, who played a really crucial role in, in bringing people together, and particularly bringing Richard Ryder together with, with the rest of the group. So, yeah, I think, I think all, of these, all of these five pieces, are, or five publications or outputs, r- remain very important. Regular listeners will know that we usually have five quick questions for our guests. But Rob, as you're a returning guest, we have four quick questions for you. Are you ready for your four quick questions? Yep, go ahead. What's been the most satisfying or rewarding aspect of conducting animal studies research? Well, contributing 
albeit in a small way, to the promotion of animal studies uh, as an important academic discipline, I think is a reward in itself. Uh, of course, there, there's an extrinsic goal here too, the, the creation of a, a world where animals are treated with uh, dignity and respect. What's been the most challenging or disheartening aspect of conducting animal studies research? Well, it's still somewhat disheartening that animal studies as an academic discipline still goes under the radar, um, certainly in, in, in political studies, political theory in particular, which has been my primary academic discipline. This, the study of animals is still regarded as peripheral and something of a fad. But this is less so than it used to be. I, I remember going for job interviews in the UK in the uh, in the 1990s where people thought that this was a, a fad that would, would soon end and they quickly wanted to talk about other academic uh, pursuits which, which they regarded as more important. I also think there's real opportunity to capitalise on the, the current popularity of identity politics in the sense that this should lead to more recognition and respect for those of us who regard ourselves as animal advocates and also for the, the you know the identity of, of veganism. Yeah, that's a very interesting thought. So my next question is quite a tricky one. Can you think of an animal studies scholar that you'd like to make listeners aware of? This, in many ways, is your chance to just give a shout out to someone who maybe isn't as well known in the animal studies community as you think they should be. This could be a young emerging scholar. It could be someone whose work's been overlooked because they're in a different discipline. Or it could be someone who writes in a language other than English, perhaps. So just somebody who you think our listeners should be looking out for, but maybe they aren't. Perhaps I should mention Ros Godlovich here, (laughs) which I really have, of course. I think I'd like to draw attention to the work of the Dutch scholar, Janneke Vink. She's just published a great book based on her PhD thesis called The Open Society and Its Animals. And it's a, it's a brilliant attempt to explain why a genuine interspecies theory of democracy is desirable and, and what it would look like. In some ways, it's a book I would like to have written. She comes to the conclusion that the best way of enfranchising animals is through a legal as opposed to a political route. Personally, I don't see those routes as being mutually exclusive. But it's a book that opens up the debate in really interesting ways, and I would recommend it strongly. Published by Palgrave. Thanks, that's a great recommendation. So, the final big question. Are you optimistic about the future of human-non-human animal relations? What a difficult question. Uh, I think that we shouldn't be too pessimistic. Um, For whatever reason, I think some animal advocates significantly underestimate the progress that's been made in drawing attention to and improving our relationship with non-human animals. In some ways, this was brought home to me during the research we did for the Oxford Group book, where we were asking people what it was like to be a vegetarian or a vegan 50 years ago. And clearly it was so much more difficult to adopt an animal-free diet then than it was now. And that alone should give us us some hope for the future. Yes, absolutely. I remember seeing it's available online. Um, There was a documentary released in the 70s about uh, being vegan. And to put it mildly, the food that was being eaten did not look very appealing. (laughs) Yes, we we were told that in the interviews, that some of the the meat substitutes were, were appalling. So what is it you're working on next? Well, now I'm freed from the demands of an academic post and now branching out into into a different style of writing commonly called creative non-fiction. And creative non-fiction very basically involves use of literary devices such as dialogue and scene setting to tell true stories. I guess the obvious kind of output here would be the so-called non-fiction novel. And one of the things I want to do is to apply it to the animals issue. So the story of the Oxford group, for instance, could be told in this style to provide an alternative to what some might think is is an overly academic account. And I can envisage doing something similar with the, the life and times of other animal pioneers. Henry Salt, for instance, would, would be a fascinating person to, to write about in that fashion. But anyway, that, that's, uh, that's for the future. And how can people find out more about your work? 
Uh, well, that's easy, I guess. I have my own website, which uh, lists all my publications, and there are links to the full text of some articles as well. So if you search for robertgarner.com, then you should get access to it. Great. Well, thanks, to Rob, for joining us for Knowing Animals. Thanks, John. And thank you, listeners, for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal studies scholars about their work. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals or on Facebook at knowing animals. You can also follow me on Twitter at Josh L. Milburn or on Instagram at a vegan philosopher. Also, don't forget to tell others about us and to review the podcast on iTunes. Reviews make it easier for others to find us. My name's Josh Milburn and I do like knowing animals. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D dot com. Oh, oh.